Does medication help tinnitus epilepsy? The answer today comes from a 2015 study by Dr. Bopana Kalapa. I like that. And colleagues at the Department of Otolaryngology and Neurobiology, University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today you get to learn about what makes the actual tinnitus signal and what makes someone more susceptible to developing tinnitus and how is it um, similar to epilepsy and maybe providing solutions. The research is not very interesting but the implications and its applications are amazing and could be incredibly useful. Before we get to the research findings let's take a journey to find where these researchers spend their time. Then we'll learn what they have to teach us today. These are scientists that are looking at the brain carefully and closely. No, even closer, microscopically, and even closer. This is certainly smaller than any normal microscope can see. They see impressive combinations of scientific methods they put together to get their results. Here's the foundation we need to understand about how tinnitus works. It begins with how nerves function and dysfunction. Neurons generate electrical signals. Every signal is identical to the previous and the next signal. And sound signals are identical to those of light, touch, and smell. The difference is that the sound signals are along sound neurons instead of light or touch neurons. In the same way, different sound pitches or frequencies travel along different sound neurons to unique specific areas of the brain in the auditory cortex. A louder sound is, more, uh, is communicated by more frequent nerve signals. It's much like a doorbell. Even though all the doorbell sounds are basically the same, you can tell where the signal is coming from by which apartment your doorbell or which apartment you hear the bell in. You can tell the intensity of the person on the other end by how frequently they press the doorbell. Of course, in the brain, there are many more options and much more need for one, uh, one wire signal to connect to another. The signal is connected or transmitted from one neuron to another across a tiny gap by chemicals. So the electrical signal travels along a neuron, then a chemical signal communicates the signal to the next neuron. The gap between these two neurons is the synapse. In our doorbell analogy, there's a gap between the doorbell button and the wire then again between the wire and the speaker. These gaps are the synapses. Now here's one of the big keys to the problem and solution of neurology, hearing loss, and tinnitus. If the neuron after the synapse gap is not activated, nothing happens. So in the case of hearing loss, it's as if the doorbell button is broken. Not even the first neuron sends a signal. In most people, the speaker stays silent. They don't hear anything in the frequency of hearing loss or they hear less in the frequency of hearing deficiency. But in the case of tinnitus, it's as if the disconnected doorbell speaker is generating its own signals. It starts sounding off spontaneously in the brain. Have you noticed how some people have the same supposed causes of tinnitus? But some people never develop tinnitus, even though they have the same cause. The researchers in this study went in search of the secret power that helps some people keep from getting tinnitus and people who get the hearing damage, that is their speaker gets disconnected, um, but it stays silent. And those people, tinnitus never develops. So the researchers started with some important information. A unique characteristic about neurons is that they are activated once. And when they are, they're more easily activated again. This is the foundation of what we call plasticity. The neurons begin to become more efficient with continued use. Much like a muscle grows stronger and has more endurance with repeated or harder exercise. This is self, and if this self-perpetuating activation continues, a neuron discharges continually or spontaneously as in seizures and tinnitus. So healthy neurons have their own braking system. In mice and probably in people, a specific, what we would say, healthy neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of their braking system prevents tinnitus from developing. The powerful break is right here, at the beginning of the neuron. It's a set of voltage-gated potassium channels. Basically, these channels leak electrical charge as the chemical tries to add more and more electrical charge. 
In our doorbell analogy, the channel leakage, this break, creates an interference in the speaker so the signal doesn't create a rapid firing that continues. So the channels prevent excessive firing that is typically associated with seizures as well as increased spontaneous firing that can trigger tinnitus. There is a seizure drug that acted on these breaking channels. It worked. These channels were open and the break was on more often. The problem is that messing with these channels with this drug called pertigabine also caused eye problems, skin discoloration, and urinary retention. Oops. So these researchers did some fancy chemistry and added a fluorine to the retigabine and they created what's called SF0034. They tested their new creation on mice and it worked even better. It was more potent and more specific. So needing a lower dosage and being more specific, they hope that it'll be less toxic too if it gets to market. Wow, that sounds like a real winner, at least as far as medications for mice go. So what can we conclude from this? Is tinnitus epilepsy? Well, not exactly, but there's some clear similarities. And in fact, they found one exact spot on the neuron that makes people, well, at least rodents, develop tinnitus after noise exposure. If the function, the neurophysiology of that spot is altered just right with the drug, tinnitus is prevented in many rodents that would have otherwise developed tinnitus. So what can you use now from this study? Well, seizure drugs may help tinnitus, but at this point, the approved ones are still quite toxic. So secondly, you probably know that I have a unique preference for natural approaches over medication. So I'll reach a little bit for this application. Some chemical approaches to treating epilepsy also seem to work for tinnitus. We know that. And since the ketogenic diet has been shown to help, has been helpful for many people with epilepsy, and since it's been shown to be helpful for brain health in general, and diet to control blood sugar has been shown to help tinnitus specifically, it might be worth trying a ketogenic diet for your tinnitus. If you like, I can talk more on tinnitus and diet in a later episode to connect a few more of those dots between nutrition and tinnitus. There's been interesting research specifically on one particular diet and its effect on tinnitus. And I also discovered some exciting information in my own research study as well. So what about future applications? Well, we could include an eating plan as part of a comprehensive self-help solution for tinnitus. Also, it would be great to have a self-assessment tool to help people know if a particular eating plan change would likely be helpful for their tinnitus. And if so, which one? So I'd like to know your thoughts. Please leave a comment or request a review of a particular research study. To stay connected to tinnitus research and therapy applications, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And to be notified of new therapies and video postings, click the bell and subscribe to our email newsletter at tinnitusenergy.com. Thank you and may God bless you.